Dalglish. Commander Adam Dalglish. That's right. Uh, you're investigating the murder of Miss Phoenicia Aldrich, QC. Uh, is that correct? That is so. Who am I speaking to? Uh, my name is Froggett, Edmund Froggett. I have information about Miss Aldrich that I'm sure will interest you. Well, Mr. Froggett, if you care to call at Scotland Yard, I'll arrange for someone to take a statement. Oh, I have no statement to make, but there's something I want to show you, and I'm afraid it has to be you. No one else will do. Uh, may I come and show you what I have? I I I'm sure you'd wish to see it. Very well. How about this evening? Say six o'clock? A Certain Justice by P.D. James Dramatised by Neville Teller With Philip Franks as Adam Dalgleish London, Autumn 1997 It should have been an easy enough case. A small community of people, a relatively secure building, a limited field of suspects. But even after the first day, I had begun to suspect that it could turn into one of those cases that all detectives abhor, where you know who the murderer is, but can't prove it. For we were, after all, dealing with lawyers. An intriguing-looking parcel, Mr. Froggett. Oh, it's very precious. That's why I keep it wrapped up. Uh, there. A scrapbook. Hmm. And these cuttings have a bearing on Miss Aldridge's death. Oh, they have a bearing on Miss Aldridge's life. And with murder... But I don't need to tell you this. The two are indissolubly linked. I, I thought I owed it to Miss Aldridge to bring this information to your attention. Uh, how useful it's likely to be is for you to say. I could see that this was likely to be a long session... But there was something about the unprepossessing little man, perhaps his air of quiet dignity, that made me curb any impatience I might feel. I just couldn't bring myself to hustle him. Perhaps you'd tell me, Mr. Froggett, just what information you do have and how you came by it. Of course. The fact is, I knew Miss Aldrich when she was very young, and I've made a point of following her career over the years. Her whole professional life is recorded in these pages in great detail. I see. And how did you come to know her? Her father owned a boys' prep school, at Dainsford in Berkshire. He was headmaster, and for five years I was his deputy. I taught history, but my abiding interest has always been criminal law. Oh, I recognised very early on that I lacked the uh, vocal and uh, physical attributes necessary to a successful barrister, but criminal law remained my main hobby, and I used to discuss cases of particular interest with Venetia. She was fourteen when we began our uh, tutorials, I suppose you'd call them, and even then... She showed a remarkable talent for analysing evidence and seizing on the fundamentals of a case. Mm, I think I can say without conceit, Mr. Dalgleish, that it was I who was chiefly responsible for making her a criminal lawyer. Was she an only child? She was, and it was a lonely childhood. Her father was an overbearing bully perhaps even something of a sadist. He'd beaten her when she was little, and she was sick with fear of him. So those evenings, when she'd come to my study, and we'd discuss the great criminal cases of the past, I believe those were the happiest hours of Venetia's life. And how long did these private tutorials continue? Oh, for more than a year. And they came to an abrupt end. You'll pack your bags and be out of this establishment by midday. Do you understand, Froggett? I can't imagine what you can have been thinking of. Entertaining my 15-year-old daughter in your rooms at night? It's monstrous. A total betrayal of your professional status. To say nothing of my trust. <laughs> no, not a word. Nothing you can say will alter the situation in any way. Just consider yourself lucky that I haven't placed the matter in the hands of the police. 
I never met Venetia Aldrich again. Ah, here she is, at Dainsford. A pretty girl. And these first cuttings? Oh, the tragedy that spelled the end of the school. Six weeks after I left, a boy committed suicide. Young Marcus had been a particular object of Aldrich's brutality. He hanged himself from the banisters with his pyjama cord. He was due to receive a beating next morning before the whole school. It all came out at the inquest. Parents fell over themselves to withdraw their boys, and Dainsford didn't survive beyond the end of that school year. But you never lost your interest in Venetia's career. Oh, you could say, Mr. Dalgleish, that for the last twenty years, Miss Venetia Aldridge's career has been my hobby. I've attended every single one of her cases throughout that time. Oh, oh I, I didn't think it right to approach her, but it was perfectly easy to attend court without her seeing me. And look, notes of how she's handled her brief in each case. Uh, uh, cuttings, and, uh, photographs. Most impressive. Uh, and here, her last big triumph, the Ash case. Oh, yes. Young Gary Ash, acquitted of murdering his aunt, wasn't he? Venetia was magnificent, brilliant. Members of the jury, in death, as in life, we are all equal before the law. Gary Ash's aunt did not deserve to die. But Mrs. O'Keefe, like all prostitutes, and that, members of the jury, is what she was, put herself peculiarly at risk because of her lifestyle. You've heard what that lifestyle was. Mrs. O'Keefe was a sexually rapacious woman. She could be affectionate and generous, but in drink she was abusive and violent. We don't know who she let in that night or what happened between them. But is it not likely, members of the jury, that she was murdered by one of her clients in a fit of jealousy, rage or hatred? As for Gary Ash, there is no forensic evidence to link him to the crime. The police found no blood on his clothes or his person. His fingerprints weren't on the knife that killed his aunt. There was that single splash of Mrs. O'Keefe's blood on the shower head and the two spots on the stairs. It has been suggested that before leaving the house to provide himself with an alibi, this young man removed his clothes, cut his aunt's throat and then showered. But any regular client would have known where the bathroom was. Members of the jury, what motive could Gary Ash have for murdering his aunt? Remembering those obscene photographs she insisted he took of her with her clients, you could wonder why he didn't leave her. But you've heard why from his own lips. She was his only living relative. The home she provided was the only home he had ever known. He never knew his father. Thrown out by his mother before he was eight, he was taken into care and shunted all his life from foster parent to foster parent, from one children's home to another. He'd never known tenderness or security or affection. No wonder he clung to his only relative. My learned friend, in his opening address, put the matter to you quite clearly. If you're convinced, beyond reasonable doubt, that my client murdered his aunt, then your verdict must be one of guilty. But if, after considering all the evidence, you have a reasonable doubt that it was indeed Gary Ash's hand that struck down Mrs. O'Keefe, then it will be your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. The Ash triumph wasn't, of course, her last case. No, indeed. You see, the last was the Cartwright case. Grievous bodily harm. She won an acquittal, of course. She so often did. That was just one day before she herself was struck down in cold blood. Mm -hmm.
It was just before ten when the call came through from Hubert Langton, the head of Chambers in Middle Temple. It's about a member of Chambers. You may have heard of her, Venetia Aldridge. Oh, of course, the leading QC, extremely well known. I, I'm afraid she's dead. Here in Chambers, our senior clerk found her body this morning. Oh dear, I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Langton.、Uh, you don't quite understand. Venetia's been murdered.、Uh, there's no doubt about it. And the blood, there's blood everywhere. She's covered in it.、Uh, Commander Delgrish,、uh, my、uh, remaining partners. Good morning. This is Detective Inspector Kate Miskin.、Uh, because Venetia was so、uh, high profile, I believe is the current terminology, and because of the likely repercussions of her murder in legal and political circles. Mr. Delbich has arranged to handle the investigation himself. Most grateful, I'm sure.、Uh, Desmond Ulrich, Commander.、Uh, next to him is Drysdale Lord.、Uh, this is Simon Costello.、Uh, we are sure it's murder. Miss Aldridge was stabbed in the heart, Mr. Costello. And the weapon had been removed. Not the only bizarre element, Inspector. Don't forget, I saw Venetia's body when I got in. Indeed, Mr. Ulrich. Miss Aldridge was found with a full-bottomed wig on her head, and blood poured all over it.、Oh, good God. Is that what happened? And it's a reasonable certainty that it was my blood, Drysdale. Oh yes, stored in my refrigerator. When I arrived this morning and opened the fridge, the pouch with the blood was missing. How long had the pouch been in there, Mr. Ulrich? I gave the blood three days ago. It was being stored for a minor operation I'm due to have on Saturday. And who knew it was there? The cleaner, Mrs. Carpenter. I left a note warning her not to clean the fridge this week. Oh, and I told Miss Caldwell, our receptionist, in case she wanted to put her milk in my fridge. I have no doubt she passed the news round chambers. Nothing is secret here. Miss Aldridge was stabbed by something like a small, thin dagger. It must have had a sharp, stiletto-like blade. Have any of you seen such a thing? I gave Venetia something very like it about、uh, two years ago. Would you describe it, please, Mr. Lord? It was a miniature of the Sword of Justice. Some grateful client presented me with it when I took silk. I happened to be with Venetia when her wooden paper knife snaps, and I passed it on to her. And it was sharp. Right,、oh, yes, extremely. But,、uh, had a kind of sheath with black leather. Oh, and、uh, my initials engraved on the blade. Well, we'll have to find it, and of course test it for prints. Afraid that means we'll need the prints of anyone who could have been in Chambers last night. We'll give you every cooperation, Inspector. Thank you. Now, what about next of kin? Have the family been told? Oh, I'm afraid events have moved too fast for that. There's an 18-year-old daughter, Octavia. She lives,、um, well, lived,、uh, with her mother. And then there's Venetia's ex-husband, Luke. He remarried,、uh, lives in Dorset, I think. The, the address will be among her papers. Luke Cummins. Well, Miss Cummins must be told as soon as possible. Kate, I'll get over there right away, sir. Norton, sir. Harry Norton, senior clerk. When did you last see Miss Aldridge? Last night, sir. A brief arrived for her by hand, just before half past six. I took it straight up to her. And after you'd handed her the brief, I closed up the office as usual, sir. Turned off the lights. Went home. Harry.、Oh, all right, Margaret. If you must know, it's that Miss Aldridge. She's absolutely set on sacking me. It's systems with her, not people. She's dead set on this idea of. A practice manager and computerisation. If she gets to be head of chambers, I'm out on my ear. No, dear. Even if Mr. Lord gets it, I doubt he's strong enough to stand up to her. They'll give me early retirement. We can kiss goodbye to any idea of a comfortable old age.、Oh, Harry. And it's all up to her, Venetia Aldridge. She won't budge. Mr. Norton. Oh, sorry, sir.、Uh, yes,、uh, I caught the normal train. I got home at the usual time. You can ask my wife, Margaret. Oh, we will. Detective Inspector Kate Miskim. Police. Oh, I'm afraid Miss Aldridge is at the chambers. It's about Miss Aldridge I've come. I have to see her daughter. I'm afraid there's bad news. Oh God. So there is something wrong. This way. You're Mrs. Buckley. That's right. I've been Miss Aldridge's housekeeper for nearly ten years. Octavia's in there with the fiance. In here, Octavia. It's the police. Miss Cummins. 
Yes? I'm afraid I have some very bad news. It's your mother. I should have known. I should have phoned the police last night when she didn't come home. When I ran chambers this morning, that man, the clerk, said she was there. Well, how could she be there? She was there, but I'm afraid she was dead. Mother dead? <laughs> but she can't be. She hasn't been ill. It wasn't a natural death, Miss Cummins. You're telling us that she was murdered? Sometime last evening, Mr... My name's Gary Ash. Gary's my fiancé. We're engaged. And before you ask, yes, I'm the one acquitted of murder. And, and you can't pin this on Gary. Mrs Buckley cooked dinner for us last night and we ate it down in my flat. She saw us together the whole evening right till bedtime, so hard luck. This time you'll have to find the real murderer. <laughs> Try her lover. Why not question bloody Mr Mark Ralston, MP? Ask him what he and my mother were quarrelling about on Tuesday night. And then her last case, Brian Cartwright. Yes, the trial was originally scheduled for Winchester Crown Court. And you'd have travelled down there? Oh, of course. But then it was transferred to London. Local prejudice against the defendant. Venetia won him a majority verdict of not guilty. I caught a glimpse of her with Cartwright after the trial. She couldn't seem to shake him off. Good work, Miss Aldridge. We certainly did for those buggers. Those mm. blood sport yobs. Keen enough to attack others, they scream blue murder when they get hurt themselves. We won, Mr Cartwright, because there was no clear evidence that it was your whip which cost young Mills his eye. And because Tooley was an unreliable witness. I should bloody well say he was. He hates my guts. I like that last bit. If my client is so prone to unprovoked violence, you may find it surprising, members of the jury, that he's never had a criminal conviction. <laughs> what a laugh. I don't think we need to fight the case again, Mr Cartwright. You didn't say that I'd never appeared before a court of law, though, did you? That would have been a lie. Counsel don't lie to the court. But they can be economical with the truth. Is that it? You do remember what I told you about last time. How I got off. I remember, Mr Cartwright, and I hope you'll keep it to yourself. You'll get my fee note in due course. I don't need additional payment in the form of private information. You're interested, though, aren't you? Admit it. After all, Simon Costello is in your chambers. But don't worry. I've kept it to myself for four years. Hardly the sort of thing I'll sell to the Sunday tabloids, is it? And thank you very much. Good afternoon, Miss Aldridge, and congratulations. You must be very pleased, and so must Mr Cartwright. Uh, we were in the gallery. We were very impressed, weren't we, Octavia? Mm. Ash? I should have thought you'd had enough of the old Bailey to last you a lifetime. I take it you two know each other? We're in love. We're thinking of getting engaged. Indeed. Then I suggest you unthink it. Ash is totally unsuitable to be your husband. And that's for Octavia to decide. Octavia, I'm walking back to Chambers. I want you to come with me. Obviously, we have to talk. Uh, Gary? I'll see you tonight. At what time shall I come round? As soon as you can. 6.30? Mm. I'll cook something for supper. Shall we go? This way. I've got 30 minutes. We'll walk through to the Temple Gardens. All right, tell me about this. When did you meet him? About three weeks ago. On the 17th of September. He crashed his bike at the end of our road. He asked if he could leave it in our basement area. He couldn't get in on a bus and he hadn't enough money for a cab. So you lent him ten pounds and, surprise, surprise, he came back next day to repay you. How did you... Yes, he came back. And after that, he came back again because I invited him. And what happened to the bike? He threw it away. He doesn't need it. He's got a motorbike. It had served his purpose. So, you met him less than a month ago. You know nothing about him, and you're telling me that you're engaged. You're not stupid enough to believe he loves you. Even you couldn't be that deluded. Gary does love me. Just because you don't, it doesn't mean no one else ever will. And I do know about him. I know more than you do. I doubt that. I know he hasn't a father, and that his mother chucked him out when he was seven. His mother chucked him out because he was unmanageable. She told the local authority she was frightened of him, frightened of a seven-year-old. Doesn't that tell you something? You do know he was accused of slashing his aunt to death. But he didn't do it. 
She was a horrible woman, always having men to the house. One of them killed her. Gary wasn't even near the place when it happened. I'm aware of the defence. I conducted it. And you told the court he didn't do it. I told the court no such thing. How many times have I explained to you that I'm not there to give the court my opinion? I'm there to test the prosecution's case. The jury has to be convinced of someone's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. <sighs> I was able to show that there was a reasonable doubt, and that's why Ash was entitled to be acquitted. So he's not guilty. In law, Octavia, in law. Only he knows the truth of the matter. S something held him and his aunt together. Something lewd, obscene, vile. I'm morally certain they were lovers. That's not true. That's a disgusting thing to say. And you can't stop us marrying. I'm over 18. I know I can't stop you. But I do have a duty to point out the dangers. Octavia, I know this young man. I made it my job to find out as much as I could about him. Gary Ash is dangerous. He may even be evil. Evil? It's not a word I normally care to use, but listen. When Ash was 15, he was in a children's home outside Ipswich. One of the social workers there, his name's Michael Cole, took a special interest in him, spent a great deal of time with him, really cared for him. Ash tried to blackmail him. He said that if Coley, as he called him, didn't regularly hand over part of his wages, he'd accuse him of sexual assault. Cole refused, and Ash carried out his threat. Cole was denounced. There was an inquiry. Of course, nothing was proved. But the authorities thought it prudent to move Cole to a post not working with children. He'll be under suspicion for the rest of his professional life. Think of Coley before you commit yourself to marriage. Ash has broken the heart of everyone who's tried to help him. I don't believe it. And he won't break my heart. Perhaps I'm like you. Perhaps I haven't got one. Lois? Darling? I'm home. I'm here, Simon. <sighs> what sort of day? Oh. Bloody. There's something I've got to tell you. Oh, yeah? Listen, this is important. Venetia Aldridge burst into my office this afternoon. She was furious. I defended Brian Cartwright today, Simon, successfully. He told me that when you were his counsel four years ago, you knew before trial that he'd suborn three of the jury. <laughs> you knew and you did nothing. You went on with the case. Is that true? He's lying. He also said he passed over some shares in his company to your fiancé. Is that true? Of course not. None of it's true. Really? Well, I hope so, Simon, for your sake. Because if one jot or tittle of this is ever proved, you can kiss goodbye to any hope of taking silk. I don't think she's going to let it rest, Lois. What do you mean? Well, at worst she could report me to the Bar Council or my inn. But it's all over. I suppose you denied it. You did deny it, didn't you? Of course I denied it! That was a bloody stupid! Curb that temper of yours, Simon, or it'll land us both in trouble. Think. She can't prove a thing. It's your word against Cartwright. But it isn't. That shared transfer is traceable. Calm down. That had nothing to do with you. We weren't even married at the time. We were a week later. But Cartwright gave them to me. Me, personally. There's nothing illegal in a friend giving me some shares, is there? Anyway, I can say you never knew anything about it. And you could say you didn't believe Cartwright about bribing the jurors. You thought it was a joke. Well, no one can prove anything. Aldridge will see that herself. She's supposed to be such a brilliant lawyer. I need another drink. It isn't as simple as that. She doesn't actually need proof. Not the kind that would stand up in court. If this gets about, I can say goodbye to any chance of taking silk. You mean Venetia Aldridge could actually stop you becoming a QC? If she wanted to take the trouble... Yes. Then you'll have to stop her. Simon, you'll have to. Someone will. I'll speak to Uncle Desmond. You always said he's the most highly regarded lawyer in chambers. No! This is the last thing that Desmond Ulrich would be sympathetic to. Not sympathetic to you, perhaps. Sympathetic to me. Now, don't forget what we owe this house to. The Cartwright shares and Uncle Desmond's loan. That's what paid the deposit, and don't you forget but it. But can't you see? The worst possible thing would be to confide in anyone about this, and especially not someone in chambers. Our only hope is to keep it quiet. Uh, 
I'll speak to Venetia. Will you do that? And soon. She's got to be stopped from taking this any further. Try her lover, Octavia had advised. Question Mr. Mark Ralston, MP. The Ralstons lived in a stuccoed Italianate house on the eastern fringes of Pimlico. How does he do this on an MP's salary? He doesn't. His wife has money. Commander Davlish. I'm Mark Ralston. How do you do? Mr. Ralston, this is Detective Inspector Miskin. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. I think I can guess what this visit's about. I had a call from a friend in Chambers just after you rang. He told me about Venetia Aldridge's death. I don't see how I can help you, but of course if I can... How well did you know Venetia Aldridge? Very well. For a time, we had an affair. It began well after her divorce. My wife knew about it for a while and finally I promised to end it. But in fact, it was Venetia who put a stop to it. It ended over a year ago. So there was no bitterness? None at all. Mr. Ralston, you were at her house on Tuesday night. Why did you call? I expect you've been talking to Octavia. Miss Cummins said you quarrelled. What about? Venetia was in a strange mood that evening. She may have been looking for a quarrel. She phoned quite late and asked me to call round. When I got there, she said she was thinking of trying for the bench. What did I think of her chances? I said she'd have to balance her ambitions against her family commitments. She said that was a bit rich coming from me. She said our affair might have lasted if I hadn't always put her second to the party. That hurt. So I said she'd always neglected her own daughter for her career. That's the bit Octavia probably caught. We saw her standing in the open doorway. It's a pity, but she only heard the truth. We had an affair. It suited us. Now it's finished. What I'm complaining about is the extraordinary way you think you can treat women. You deceived Lucy because you fancied some sex spiced with danger, and you knew that I was discreet. Now, suddenly, you need your wife. The chance of a government post, and she's become a political asset. So, Lucy promises to overlook the infidelity, in return, no doubt, for your promise that our affair is over. I'll never see her again. It never really meant anything. It was always you I loved. Isn't that how it goes? It wasn't like that. Your name wasn't mentioned. The reason's quite different. Lucy's pregnant. I thought Lucy couldn't have children. That's what we thought. The baby's due in February. How convenient. All done by prayer and candles, I suppose. Or was it an immaculate conception? Does she know about the abortion? When you had that reconciling little talk, did you think to mention that 12 months ago I aborted your child? No, she doesn't know. And you won't tell her, will you, Venetia? Probably not. But you'll never be certain, will you? You said you never wanted another child. You don't even care for the one you had. Shh! Octavia! I left almost at once. I didn't want to be caught in the middle of another of Venetia's rows with her daughter. And can you tell me, Mr. Ralston, where you were between half past seven and ten o'clock yesterday? <laughs> Not murdering Venetia, if that's what you're implying. I was in the Commons most of the evening. At around seven I met a journalist, Pete Maguire, for a drink. At eight o'clock I had a meeting with a group of constituents in the central lobby. I've written down their names. Here. And I was back here for dinner at nine. My wife will confirm that. She did. So I turned to Venetia Aldridge's second squire, Drysdale Lord. Yes, Venetia often worked late. She'd occasionally stay until ten. She preferred not to work at home. And who was the last person to see her yesterday, Mr. Lord? Probably our chief clerk, Harry Norton. He tells me that he took a brief up to her at 6.30. I think the rest of us had left by then, but the cleaner may have seen her. That's a Mrs. Carpenter. How did you acquire her? From a domestic agency. Do you happen to know which one, Mr. Lord? Miss Elkingsons. They're well known in the temple, quite a flourishing business. And this Mrs. Carpenter, she has a key? Of course. And so does Miss Elkington. The cleaner is an extremely reliable woman. She lets herself in at around half past eight, works till about ten, and sets the alarm when she leaves. Mr. Lord, I believe you were quite close to Miss Aldridge. Well, we weren't lovers, if that's what you mean. I, I escorted her to official functions, dinners, that sort of thing. It was an arrangement that suited both of us. I was merely wondering if you'd noticed anything unusual about her in the past few days. Well, yes. I'm not saying it's got anything to do with Venetia's death, though it, it could be a factor. Yes? Her daughter Octavia has taken up with a young man Venetia defended a month ago on a charge of murder, Gary Ash. She learned about it on Monday. Obviously, she was desperately worried. Hello? Drysdale, I need to see you. Tonight, if possible. Are you alone? 
Yes, I, I've just seen my mother into a taxi, but I, it can't be wait. It's after eleven. No, it can't. I'll be with you as soon as I can. Uh, what do you have to drink? Uh, nothing. Anything. Uh, red wine. No. I'm sorry to come at such short notice, but I need your help. You remember that boy Gary Ash I defended a few weeks back? Of course. Well, I saw him at the Bailey after my case today. He's taken up with Octavia. According to her, they're engaged. <sighs> well, that's great. When did they meet? After the trial, of course. But obviously it's a put-up job on his part, and, and I want it stopped. Hmm. Well, I can see that it's unwelcome, but I don't see how you can stop it. Octavia's of age, isn't she? What could you allege against him? He, he was acquitted. You've spoken to Octavia? Well, of course. She's adamant. Well, she would be. Part of his attraction is the power he gives her to hurt me. Mm. Look, Drysdale, this has been engineered by one or both of them, and it's directed against me. But I would have expected Ash to be grateful. You don't know Ash. He isn't grateful, and I don't want his gratitude. I want him out of my life. Well, well if you don't interfere, it'll probably pass. Look, he thought he was going to inherit from his aunt. Well, she liked to give the impression there was money, and she spent pretty freely on him. Photographic equipment, a motorbike. But she died in death, and he won't get a penny. Mm. This is his way of getting what he thinks he deserves. Can't you picture it in the Sunday papers? Mummy saved my boyfriend from prison. Top QC's daughter tells the story of their love. Venetia, I... One thing could stop him. Money. I thought that you might see him and find out how much he wants. Buy him off. I'd be willing to go to £10,000. Venetia, I'm sorry. If you want to pay him off, you'll have to do it yourself or get your solicitor to try. I can't possibly be involved. You're afraid of publicity. Just think of the press coverage. If something like this went wrong, they'd have a field day. So you won't help? Venetia, how much does this really matter to you? How much would you be willing to give up for it? Becoming head of chambers when Hubert retires, for example? Blackmail? A deal. Drysdale, we've had this discussion. I've made it quite clear that as senior member after Hubert, I'll be the next head. That wasn't always your position. You told a chambers meeting a few years ago that you weren't interested. Everyone regards me as next in line. Well, I've changed my mind, Drysdale. And you'd better get used to the idea. You will not be next head of chambers. A most impressive piece of work, this scrapbook of yours, Mr. Froggett. The work of years. And as you say, it certainly provides a very detailed record of Miss Aldridge's professional life. You know, I'd rather like to study it more closely. Would you mind very much if I kept it for a little? Oh, I'd be honoured, Mr. Dalglish. I read again the accounts of Gary Ash's trial. Taken together with Kate's description of her meeting with him, the impression of a complex, devious, flawed character emerged strongly. Get into your bike things. I've got something to show you. Oh, but, Gary, darling, I said I cook supper for you. I I've got steak. It'll wait. We'll have it when we get back. Uh, all right. Where are we going? You'll see. Do you still live here, on your own? I've nowhere else. Come on, close the back door. Is the electricity still on? Oh, it is. At present. Come on through. Come and see the hall. There. <gasps> wow! I've never seen anything like this in all my life! It's, it's what they call a collage, isn't it? Where on earth did all these pictures come from? Oh, uh, magazines, posters, books, journals, postcards, whatever. There's so many. The whole hallway, all the way up the stairs. It's crazy. But it's wonderful. Did you do all this? Auntie and me. I worked out the pattern, but it was her idea. Oh, I like it. God, it's clever. But it must have taken months. Two months and three days. Look in here. This was Auntie's room. Is this where she met her clients? On that couch. This was her place. Everything happened here. Where were you? I mean, when she was in here with one of those men. I was here too. She liked me to be here. She, she liked me to watch. Didn't your mother tell you? She knew it. It came out at the trial. So is this... Is this where it happened? Is this where she was killed? On the couch. But it looks so clean, so ordinary. There's... There's something else I could show you. Upstairs. 
Do you want to see? Why not? This was your home, where you lived. I want to see everything. This is my dark room. See all this equipment? Auntie paid for everything, the camera as well. She wanted me to take pictures. What sort of pictures? Her with her clients. She liked to look at them afterwards. What happened to them? They were exhibits for the defence. I don't know where they are now. The police tried to trace the men, but not very hard. They had me, didn't they? Know what this is? Uh, no. It's an enlarger. Want to see how it works? If you like. I'll have to turn off the main light and put on the red one. It doesn't take very long. Look. In here. You can see the picture developing. See? Here it comes. Oh, my God. This is your aunt, isn't it? After the murder. Oh, the blood, Gary, it's awful. Oh, it feels sick. Who took it? I did. I took it when I got back and found her. But why would you want it? Because I always photographed Auntie on that couch. That's what she liked. Weren't you afraid that the police would find it? A strip of film is easy to hide. <laughs> Stay here. Someone's broken in. Uh, don't move. Here. <laughs> All clear. You can come down now. It was only a couple of kids from the estate. God, you look awful. I thought it was the police. I tore up the picture. I flushed it down the loo. I was afraid they'd find it. I'm sorry. Oh, come here. There's nothing to be sorry about. There. I've got something for you. Here. What do you think of that? Oh. Oh. That wasn't her ring, was it? She, she wasn't wearing it when she died. Now, would I do that to you? She had one like it, but I bought this specially for you. I thought you'd like it. I do. Gary, I... I, I love it. I wear it all the time. I don't want to take it off ever. It shows we belong together. Well, I don't see why we have to stay cooped up in here as if we were suspect. I mean, it's obvious that someone from outside got in and killed her. Really, Simon? And what intruder would have known where that full-bottomed wig was kept? All about the blood in the fridge? Oh, do think, Drysdale. The murderer doesn't have to be the same person who decorated her with that bloody wig. Bloody in more than one sense. It was an extraordinarily insensitive thing for anyone to do. It isn't particularly pleasant, you know, having blood taken. Now I'll have to cancel the operation and start all over again. Oh, for God's sake, Desmond, what does that matter? All you've lost, however inconvenient, is a pint of blood. Venetia is dead, and we've got a murder in chambers. Indeed we have, Drysdale. And, yes, Simon, I've no doubt we are considered suspects. Unless, of course, we have alibis that satisfy Commander Delgleish. Well, I certainly haven't, Hubert. Unless she was killed after 8.15. I left chambers around a quarter past seven, went home, fed the cat and washed, and then I returned to have dinner at Rules in Maiden Lane. Yesterday was my birthday. I've had dinner at Rules on my birthday since I was a boy. Alone? As always. <laughs> and I've no doubt, Simon, that the maitre d' will confirm that I was at my table by 8.15. Why didn't you go straight to the restaurant from here? Why bother to go home? A lot of trouble, wasn't it, just to feed the cat? Your interest in my movements and motives, Simon, is very flattering, but may I suggest you leave the police work to the police? As for me, I haven't the slightest interest in what you were doing last night. I left Chambers at six o'clock and went home. Lois can confirm that. What about you, Drysdale? Isn't all this a bit pointless until we know the exact time of death? As it happens, I went to the Savoy Theatre to see you when we are married. Oh, conveniently close. Convenient for what, Simon? Are you suggesting I dashed out in the interval, killed Venetia and got back in time for the second act? I suppose the police will check. Personally, I don't think it's possible. There's a van pulling up down below. I mm. presume it's come to take Venetia's body. I suppose that means Commander Delgleish will be joining us shortly. Mm. You know him, Hubert? Do you like him? I am not quite sure what to make of him. The word is he could have been commissioner 
or at least a chief constable. I don't know why he isn't. Unless his verse. True. I don't suppose a reputation for writing poetry is any sort of recommendation for promotion in the Metropolitan Police. Uh, uh, come in. Ah, Norton. Uh, yes, what's happened? They found the murder weapon, sir. At, at least uh, that's what they think it is. Miss Aldrich's paper knife. Where? In the outer office. The bottom filing drawer. Oh, here's Commander Dalgleish now, sir. Mr. Lord, can you confirm that this is the steel paper knife you gave to Miss Aldrich? Well, of course, I mean, there could scarcely be two. You'll find my initials on the blade. Can this really be what killed her? I mean, it's so clean. Oh, it's been thoroughly wiped, Mr. Langton. We'll have to await the post-mortem report to be certain this was the weapon. Well, gentlemen, you've been very patient. I'm sure you want to get back to your rooms. Thank you, you very much. Um, one thing. Before you leave Chambers this evening, I'd be grateful if you'd let one of my officers know where you were from 6.30 onwards last night. If you could write down the details in advance, it would be helpful. Thank you very much. Come in. We've, uh, we've brought the cleaner back, sir. Mrs. Janet Carpenter. Oh, right. Bring her in, Kate. And stay, will you? This way, Mrs. Carpenter. Mrs. Carpenter, I'm sorry we had to bring you back so urgently. Please take a seat. Inspector Miskin has told you that Miss Aldridge is dead. Uh, she didn't say how. We believe Miss Aldridge was murdered. Good God. We'll know more after the post-mortem, but it must have been sometime last night. Now, we need to know precisely what happened from the time you arrived here. When was that? 8.30, the same as usual. I work Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays until about 10 o'clock. How do you get into Middle Temple? Aren't all the gates locked to 8? I have a key to the judge's gate at Devereux Court. And when you got here? I unlocked the front door. The, the alarm hadn't been set, but sometimes the last person in chambers does forget to set it. Everything else seemed as usual. Did you see Miss Aldridge? I saw no one. They'd all left, at least I thought so. What about Miss Aldridge's room? The outer door was locked. I thought she'd left for the day and locked up behind her. She did that sometimes when she had to leave out important papers. You're sure there was no light visible from her room? Quite sure. Her room was at the front and I'd have noticed when I arrived. The only light on in chambers was the one in the hall. I turned that off when I left, after I'd set the alarm. Besides Miss Aldridge's, what other rooms couldn't you get into? Um, Mr Costello's on the second floor. The other doors were all open. I finished off down in the basement in Mr Ulrich's room. Was it your job to clean Mr Ulrich's refrigerator? Oh, yes. He likes me to clear it out occasionally. He uses it mostly for his milk or food for his dinner if he buys it during the day. Of course, at the moment, he's got his pouch of blood stored there, ready for his operation. It's in a transparent plastic bag. I'd have had quite a shock if he hadn't warned me. When did you first see the blood? On Monday. He, he left me a note on his desk. And was the blood in the fridge last night? Well, it must have been. Mr Ulrich hasn't had his operation yet. Mind you, I didn't look in the fridge yesterday. I meant to clear it out tomorrow evening. Mrs Carpenter, I want you to think very carefully. While you were cleaning chambers last night, could anyone already here, perhaps in one of the locked rooms, have left the building without your noticing? Well, yes, I suppose so. It, if someone had been in Mr Ulrich's room or anywhere in the basement, they could have left while I was cleaning the upper floors. There is one thing I have just remembered. Oh, what's that, Mrs Carpenter? Not long before I arrived, someone had been using the ladies' lavatory in the basement. How can you be sure of that? The water takes an awfully long time to drain away. I have reported it. There was about half an inch of water in the bottom of the basin. I remember thinking that Miss Aldrich must have washed just before leaving. But then Miss Aldrich didn't leave, did she? <laughs> Desmond Ulrich. Dunks, I've been trying all day to get you. I didn't like to ring Chambers. Look, I haven't got long. Simon's with the twins, but I want to come round. Don't do that. 
But we have to see each other. The police are sure to question me. I, I don't know what to say. We have to talk. We don't have to talk. If you need to talk, talk to your husband. Talk to Simon. But, Dunks, this is murder. You know I hated the woman. I told you what she was threatening to do to us, but I didn't want her murdered. Lois, I'm capable of much folly. But do you really think me capable of committing murder? Even for the convenience of my favourite niece. So, Kate, what have we got? Right, time of death, according to the post-mortem, was between 7.30 and 8.30. I had a word with Dr Kinderston, and I don't think he'll be any more precise in court, but privately, he thinks she was dead by 8, or very soon afterwards. She was last seen alive just before 6.30 by the senior clerk, Harry Norton. We know she was still alive at 7.45. Oh, yes, Mrs Buckley's phone call. I'm sorry, Miss Aldridge. I know you hate being troubled in chambers, but I really don't know what to do. Octavia has that horrible young man in her flat, and she's demanding that I cook dinner for them. Well, not only dinner, but a vegetarian meal. I don't mind helping out, but this isn't what I'm paid for. But, oh, for heaven's sake, Mrs Buckley. If she wants vegetables, cook her vegetables. I'll talk to her and sort it out when I get home. I'll be back in an hour. I can't discuss it now. I have someone with me. And that someone could well have been the killer. Go on, Kate. Well, everyone in Chambers claims to have left well before then. Still, somewhere around eight o'clock, Miss Aldridge must have admitted the murderer to her room. According to the post-mortem, she was forced back against the wall, bruising the back of her head, and the knife was stuck straight to the heart. There was almost no blood. Afterwards, the body was dragged across the carpet, put in the chair and tied up. Then the murderer probably took the knife down to the lady's lavatory in the basement, washed it clean and put it in the bottom drawer of the office filing cabinet on the way out. But that's only half the story, isn't it? At some time after all this, the murderer, or someone else, took the full-bottomed wig from the clerk's office and the pouch of blood from Desmond Ulrich's fridge and decorated the body. Yeah, and whoever did that knew exactly where to find both. So I suppose the big question is, are the murderer and the prankster one and the same? Let's concentrate on the murder. Assuming it wasn't a random killing, I think that's a fair assumption, then it's someone connected with these chambers. I'm inclined to discount Hubert Langton. As head of chambers and shortly due to retire, he'd seem to have no motive. The murder took place around eight o'clock. If we believe their stories, Drysdale Lord was at the Savoy Theatre, curtain up 7.30. Simon Costello was at home with his wife. Desmond Ulrich was on his way to his birthday dinner. He was certainly at his table by 8.15. Mark Ralston, MP, was in the House of Commons. Yeah, we need to check those timings he gave us, sir. Quite right. Where was I? Ah, Harry Norton, the Chief Clerk, says he left Chambers at around 6.45. He says he arrived home at his normal time, did he? I'll check that, sir. And Janet Carpenter. She says she got here at 8.30. There's no one to verify that. Kate, I think it might be a good idea if you looked into Mrs Carpenter's background. I assure you, Detective Inspector, the cleaning service I provide to the Inns of Court is reliable, efficient and discreet. I'm sure it is, Miss Elkington. Your agency seems to be very highly regarded. I take up all references and check them thoroughly. As you did with Mrs Janet Carpenter. Could you tell me how she came to be employed? Oh, Mrs Carpenter came to me nearly three years ago. She phoned for an appointment. You see, Miss Elkington, I've only recently moved to central London from Hereford. Oh, yes. Why is that? Well, my husband died not too long ago following a family tragedy. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, we lost our only granddaughter. She died. Oh, dear. I wanted to make a new start. Of course, here in London, money's a bit tight, and I need a few hours' domestic work each week. Well, this agency specialises in working for the lawyers in the ends of court. That's why I'm here, Miss Elkington. I like the idea of working in chambers. At one time, my husband and I were regular attenders at the Temple Church. So I first asked about work in Mr Langton's chambers. They told me there about your agency. Well, we can usually place a worker of the right calibre. As it happens, I do need an extra pair of hands for Sir Roderick Matthews' chambers. I'll take up your references... And if I find them satisfactory, I think I'll be able to offer you the job. She was there for about six months, but when I had a vacancy for her in Mr. Langton's chambers, she asked to be transferred. Did she give any reason for preferring that set? Mm, not really, except that when she inquired there, she'd liked the look of the place. Sir Roderick's staff was sorry to see her go. And Mrs. Carpenter's doing well? 
in Paulet Court? They seem very satisfied. And I understand that she occasionally helps out in Miss Aldridge's house when an extra pair of hands is needed. That's a private arrangement, of course. It doesn't go through my books.、Mm. And, and Mrs. Carpenter's references?、Uh, just a moment.、Uh, I had three, all from Hereford. Her bank manager, the parish priest, and a local magistrate. I spoke to each of them. They all thought very highly of her. Very highly indeed. Monday was a perfect autumn day, and I decided to take advantage of it by motoring down to Dorset to interview Octavia's father. Nearing my destination, I suddenly felt an urge to glimpse the sea. I turned off and went right down to the coast above Lulworth Cove. There, I enjoyed a solitary picnic, gazing out over a panorama of hills, green fields, and small coppices to the wide stretch of the Channel. A drive back of only a few miles, and I found the sign directing me to the Perigold Pottery, an isolated cottage lying some fifty yards from the road. From the cottage came the gentle sound of a turning wheel. I stood in the doorway. The woman, absorbed in her work, completed her pot, took a wire and sliced it from the wheel, and carried it over to the table. Oh, you must be Commander Dalgleish. I'm Anna Cummins. I was expecting you. Come in. Don't the police usually come in pairs? Usually, but I was tempted by the autumn day and a need for solitude. I'm sorry if I spoiled the pot. Oh, you haven't spoiled anything. You want, of course, to talk to Luke. I don't think he'll be long. He's been delivering some pots to Cool. Please sit down. Perhaps I can tell you something of what you want to know. Well, I want to talk to your husband about his late wife. I know they divorced eleven years ago, but he may know something about her, her friends, even an enemy that could help. In a murder inquiry, one must learn as much as possible about the victim. When did you yourself last see Miss Aldridge? Three years ago, when she brought Octavia here to stay with her father for a week, the visit was an unmitigated disaster. It was never repeated. And neither you nor your husband have seen Miss Aldridge since then. No. Of course, I would have seen her last Wednesday night if she'd come to the gate.、Uh, Excuse me. Are you telling me that you were in London on the night she was murdered? Yes. But didn't you realise that this is important information? You should have spoken to me earlier. You said you were coming. I thought it better to wait until you arrived. Well, I'm here now. Please tell me exactly what happened. Venetia phoned me early on Wednesday morning. It was just before eight. Look, I need to talk to Luke. It's about Octavia. Luke's already left in the truck. Can I take a message? I need his help. Octavia's got herself involved with someone totally unsuitable. Someone I've just offended on a murder charge. She says she's going to marry this Gary Ash. I've got no influence with her at all. She delights in causing me as much anguish as possible. Luke must do something about it. He's her father. Let him take some responsibility for a change. Buy this Ash off. Take Octavia abroad. Anything. I'll pay. Look, I've got to leave for the Crown Court any minute, but I must see him in chambers this evening, say eight fifteen. He can get into Middle Temple through the gate at the end of Devereux Court. I'll come down and unlock it. I shan't keep him waiting, and I don't expect to be kept waiting myself. Even while we were speaking, I'd made up my mind that I'd go to London, not Luke. And when he got back, he agreed. I was afraid Venetia would persuade him into something he didn't want to do. He couldn't take Octavia abroad. His place is here with his family. His family. We have a daughter, Marie. She's at nursery school at the moment. Luke will pick her up on his way back. So, of course, we couldn't both go to London. I went, and I was outside the Devereux Court gate at ten past eight, and I waited until eight forty. She didn't appear. I left. Did you see anyone else come through the gate? Three or four, but only one I might recognise again. It was his bright red hair. He arrived at about quarter past eight and unlocked the small door in the gate, but he was only in the temple for a few minutes. He came out again very soon. And you think you'd know him again? I think so. There's a lamp above the gate. Venetia Aldridge, her life in detail, remarkable. Ah yes, Dainsford School. Her father owned a boys' prep school. Dainsford in Berkshire. And these first cuttings? Oh, the tragedy that spelled the end of the school. Six weeks after I left, a boy committed suicide. Death at Dainsford. 
Police were called to Dainsford School early on Wednesday morning when Marcus Ulrich, 11, was found hanging from banisters by the cord of his pyjamas. Foul play is not suspected. Young Marcus had been a particular object of Aldrich's brutality. He was due to receive a beating next morning. Hmm. Early cases. Venue, defendant, judge, counsel for the prosecution, for the defence. Details of the case. Arguments used on both sides. Extraordinary. Cuttings, photographs. Hold on. Q outside Old Bailey, waiting for trial of Matthew Price, the 20th of November, 1994. And there, staring at me from the pages of the scrapbook, was... See? Good heavens, sir. Janet Carpenter. But what on earth was she doing there? Was she involved in the case? Not that I could see. I went over the details in Venetia Aldridge's notebooks. She was defending a small-time crook who shot and wounded a jeweller during an armed robbery. No apparent connection. So I went back to Mr. Froggett's scrapbook and examined the cases even more carefully. And then I found Mrs. Carpenter's name. Look, back here. The two Beale cases. Two Beale cases? Yes. The first is in October 1992. See? Desmond Beale accused of the rape and murder of a ten-year-old girl. Venetia Aldridge defends him. Mr. Froggett can hardly contain himself at her brilliance. And, of course, she got him off. Oh, my goodness. Yes, Kate. One year later, Dermot Beale convicted at Shrewsbury Crown Court of the rape and murder of 12-year-old Emily Carpenter. And here, among the witnesses... Mrs. Janet Carpenter. The little girl was her granddaughter. Venetia Aldridge had engineered Dermot Beale's acquittal so that he could kill again. And full marks to Mr. Froggett. Though she played no part in the second trial, he includes details in the interests of completeness and truth. It's the motive, sir. And now we've got the lot. Motive, means, and opportunity. But it is odd. I could have sworn that when you interviewed her in Chambers, the murder was news to her. It still could have been. Look, first thing tomorrow morning, we'll go and see Janet Carpenter. Meanwhile, I have a couple of calls to make. Come in, come in. Thank you, Mr. Ulrich. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Not at all. There's always plenty to get on with. Take a seat. Thank you. Now, how can I help you? Just a few questions. Mr. Ulrich, did you know that Venetia Aldridge was the daughter of Clarence Aldridge, once headmaster of Dainsford School? Yes, I knew. <laughs> when she joined Chambers, I was struck by her name. I asked her. And what happened? Well, she said she was his daughter. And then I told her that I was the elder brother of Marcus Ulrich. She said she wasn't surprised. She'd noted my name. Ulrich isn't very usual. I said, I don't think either of us needs to talk about the past. And that was that. Neither of us mentioned Dainsford again. May I ask what happened about your brother? I was 11 years older than Marcus. I went to my father's old prep school, but our circumstances changed. By the time Marcus was eight, money was tighter, my father was working overseas, and I was at Oxford. Dainsford had a good record of getting boys into public school. No one knew about Aldridge's perversion. He was a sadist. He liked beating small boys, and he liked doing it in public before the assembled school. It was the ritual humiliation that Marcus couldn't take. He was timid, sensitive. He hanged himself. It wasn't Venetia Aldridge's fault. Of course not. Someone bears a heavy responsibility for my brother's death, but it wasn't, isn't Venetia Aldridge. And as I said, we never discussed it. Private lives are best kept out of chambers. Mr. Costello, I went to Wareham last week to see Venetia Aldridge's ex-husband and his wife Anna. Anna Cummins expected to meet Miss Aldridge at the Devereux Court entrance at 8.15 on the night of the murder. Obviously, Miss Aldridge didn't come to let her in, but while waiting, Mrs. Cummins did see a man with bright red hair. If we bring her to London, I think there's a strong possibility she'll recognise you. Yes. I saw a woman loitering in the passage. She was there when I went in, and was still there when I came out. No doubt she'll confirm that I was only in the temple for a minute. That's what she told me. I went on impulse. I wanted to see Venetia. I had some important matters to discuss. Changes she might make if she became head of chambers. I knew she often worked late, but when I walked into Paulet Court and saw her light was out, it meant she'd already left. So I turned round and came out. 
when you were questioned, you said you'd left chambers at six and that your wife could confirm you were at home all evening. And she did. Yeah. What happened was that she felt a little queasy after dinner and went to lie down. She thought I was downstairs all the time. She was mistaken. Commander, I'm a criminal lawyer. I advise my clients to answer police questions honestly, but not to volunteer information. I saw little need to confuse the issue by dwelling on my brief outing to the temple. When Kate and I called at Janet Carpenter's flat next morning, there was no answer. Her next-door neighbour was sure she'd gone off on holiday the previous night. All the same, we borrowed the key and went in. Call it premonition, but as I pushed open the door, I knew what we'd find. Janet Carpenter her throat cut, was lying on her back, her left leg grotesquely bent. Close to her right hand was a kitchen knife, blade and handle heavily bloodstained. Her left sleeve had been pushed up, and on the inner arm something was written in blood. We squatted beside the body. R.V. Beale, 1992. Beale, who raped and murdered Emily Carpenter one year after Aldridge got him acquitted. So Janet Carpenter killed her and then committed suicide. It's a thought. I suppose that slit on her left wrist provided the blood for the message. I looked at her hands. Then I gently pressed the flesh at the base of the fingers on her left hand. Let's have a look at the kitchen. Come on. What are we looking for, sir? Anything strike you as odd? Not really. I'd probably put the washing up liquid the other side of the sink. You think she was left-handed, sir? Just look at her left hand. She did housework for a living, remember? You can confirm it with Miss Elkington. But if she was, then that message on the left arm couldn't have been written by her. And this is no suicide. It's murder, pure and simple. I spoke to the next-door neighbour again, Mrs Capstick. She confirms that she last saw Janet Carpenter yesterday night going out to post a letter. But before that, Mrs Capstick saw her on Sunday afternoon. She was going into the church at the end of the Crescent, St James's. Is it worth calling in, sir? I suppose there's a chance it'll be open. A good chance it usually is. I know the parish priest, a remarkable man. They say he knows more <clears throat> secrets in and out of the confessional than any man in London. If he's involved in all this, we may have complications. It's Adam Delgleish, isn't it? It must be six years since we last met. It's good to see you. You're well, I hope. Thank you, Father. May I introduce Detective Inspector Kate Miskin? I'm afraid we're here on police business. I thought you might be. How can I help? This picture. I think you may have seen this woman, Mrs Janet Carpenter, on Sunday afternoon. Let me see. Yes, she came to confession. Why? What's happened? We found her this morning in her sitting room with her throat cut. It's almost certainly murder. God rest her soul. We need any information you can give which will help us discover why she was killed and who killed her. If I can help, of course I will. But I'd never met Mrs. Carpenter before Sunday. Everything I now know about her was told to me under the seal of the confessional. I'm sorry. That's what I feared. But, Father, it's murder. Surely you could tell us if she confessed to killing Venetia Aldridge. If so, we needn't waste our time looking for someone else. Mrs. Carpenter's dead. She can't care now whether you break faith with her. My child, it isn't Janet Carpenter I'd be breaking faith with. I'm sorry. I can't reveal what she told me. But perhaps there's one way I could help. Before she left the church, Mrs. Carpenter said she'd write me a letter. She said that after I'd read it, I could do with it as I thought right, including showing it to the police. She may have changed her mind. No letter may exist. But if she did write it, and she authorises me to pass it on to you, I'll certainly consider doing so. Well, she was certainly seen leaving the house last night with a letter in her hand. She must have missed the last collection, so it might arrive here tomorrow. We'll come back in the morning. Here it is. I've read it, and she's authorised me to give it to you. That poor, tortured soul. We'll need to take it with us, I'm afraid. I'll give you a receipt. Dear Father Prestine, I told you that my daughter-in-law, Emily's mother, committed suicide. I found it terrible to confess to you that when she died all I felt was relief. But I don't think I could have gone on living with her grief and stayed sane. She lived every hour in the black horror of Emily's murder. I'd loved my darling granddaughter too, 
But for me, grief was subsumed in a terrible, all-consuming anger focused on Venetia Aldridge. If Dermot Beale hadn't been acquitted after his first trial, he couldn't have been free to kill again. But she'd defended him brilliantly. Oh, I knew she was only doing her job, but to her it was a game. She won her victories, and for her that was the end. Others had to live with the consequences, pay the price. This time I wanted her to pay. Slowly an idea took shape. Suppose a young man accused of, say, murder, was successfully defended by Venetia Aldridge, and then afterwards he seduced, perhaps even married, her daughter. That would be nemesis of a sort. To contrive this, I'd need money. The young man would have to be bribed, and with a sum he couldn't resist. And I'd need to move to London to get to know Venetia Aldrich's life. I'd have to attend as many of her trials as possible when the crime was serious and the defendant a young male. I determined to put the plan into action. I sold the house in Hereford, the mortgage was long paid off and the proceeds were substantial. I rented a small flat in London. I found a cleaning job in Middle Temple and eventually succeeded in moving to Aldrich's chambers. It all went so smoothly that if I was superstitious, I'd have believed my great revenge was preordained. For finally, in court number one at the Old Bailey, I saw Gary Ash, and I knew my search had ended. Looking at him in the dock day after day, I sensed in him the power, the intelligence, the greed, the ruthlessness I needed. As soon as the trial ended, I wrote a letter to Ash. I told him I had a proposal to put to him, a job that wasn't either dangerous or illegal, but for which I'd be prepared to pay £50,000 in cash. I said that if he were interested, I was waiting in the back garden. I see you got my note. You'd better come in. In here. Well? It's simple. Venetia Aldrich has a daughter, Octavia. She's just 18. I'm willing to pay you £20,000 to seduce her and another 30000 if she agrees to marry you. You do very well out of it. She's an only child and she has money. For me, it's a matter of revenge. Revenge comes pretty dear, doesn't it? You could have Aldrich killed for less. I don't want her killed. I want her to suffer. Why? If I didn't tell him, there'd be no bargain. So I told him everything. Dermot Beale, my granddaughter, everything. And it was settled there and then in that stinking kitchen. Two people without conscience bargaining over a body and a soul. I handed him 2000 on the spot and said I'd pay him the rest of the money in instalments, the final payment when they were married. It didn't take him long to earn his first 20000 He and Octavia were engaged by the time I now come to. The death of Venetia Aldrich. On the night of the 9th of October, I got to Chambers at the usual time and started work. After finishing the ground floor offices, I went up to the first floor. Miss Aldrich's outer door was unlocked. The inner door was ajar and the room in darkness. I turned on the light. At first I thought she was asleep in her chair. I said, I'm sorry. When she didn't respond to the light or to my words, I went up to her and I could see that she was dead. But she looked perfectly peaceful. There was nothing to show that she'd been murdered, no blood, nothing. I thought it was a heart attack. And then it swept over me. She cheated me of my great revenge. All that planning, all that expense, and now she'd escaped forever. I decided on a last gesture. It was then that I fetched the blood and the wig. She deserved that final humiliation in death. Then I went out as usual. It was only when I was interviewed the next morning in Chambers that I learned that Venetia Aldrich had been murdered. That was when the enormity of what I'd done struck me. I'd conspired with evil to do evil. I, who had lost a granddaughter by murder, had put another young person into a murderer's power. 
That's why I came to you, father, and made my confession. That was the first step. You said the next steps were to go to the police and to put things right with Octavia. So when Ash rings me on Tuesday morning, I'll tell him to bring Octavia to see me that evening. If he refuses, I'll go and see Octavia myself. One way or another, I'll tell her the truth. She may not believe me. She may still want to marry him, but if she does, it must be with the knowledge of what he is, and what he and I, together, have done. And then I'll go away for a week to decide what's to be done with the rest of my life. I give you authority to show this letter to the police. I think they already know I was responsible for decorating the body, and they'll want to question me. But that can wait a week. I'll be back in seven days. But I must have a bit of breathing space to think. Janet Carpenter. So Ash turned up for the appointment and overpowered her when she opened the door. Or, or was Octavia with him? Were, were they in it together? I don't think so. I doubt he'd risk committing murder in front of her. But he'll probably rely on her for an alibi. Did Ash kill Venetia Aldridge? Oh no, that crime rests where we always thought in chambers. But now we must get round to the Aldridge house. But they've gone, Mr. Dalgleish. Yesterday evening, do come in. What happened? Did they leave in a hurry? They certainly did. It was very odd. They were down in Octavia's flat, cutting up pictures to paste on the walls. It was an idea they dreamt up from somewhere. And Ash came up to the kitchen to ask for another pair of scissors.、Uh, that was at nine o'clock. Within minutes, he was back, very angry. He said he couldn't use them. It was only then I realised I'd given him the pair Mrs. Carpenter left here, when she'd been helping out during my holiday. Mrs. Carpenter was left-handed. What did Ash do when you told him? That's what was so extraordinary. He went very white, and stood absolutely still for a moment. Then he screamed some sort of obscenity and drove the scissors into the tabletop. He went out without another word. I heard them moving about, packing probably. About ninety minutes later, they both drove away on his motorbike. This is it. We have to get through this wood. I'll wheel the bike. Jump off. Let's get started. Oh, Gary, it's magical. A sea of reeds. Where are we? These are the wetlands with the fens. See that clump of trees?、Oh. No, no, over there. But just behind them, there's an old house. It's on an island. You get to it over a footbridge. No one ever goes near it. That's where we're bound for. Come on, let's carry our things. I- I'll come back for the motorbike later. This room's dry. We'll be okay here. We'll make a fire. I can hear the sea. It can't be far away. About a mile. What do you think of this place? It's secret. How did you find it? I used to come here when I was in that children's home at Ipswich. Were you always alone? Didn't you have a friend? I'll go and get the bike. Won't it be too heavy for that footbridge? The bike seems pretty rotten to me. I won't risk it. Watch me. Are you all right? I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, that's that, isn't it? Goodbye, Kawasaki. But, but we're we're cut off. How are we going to get home? Oh, we can swim for it. Then we can hitch a ride into Ipswich. We can take a train from there into London. We've got money. I'll get dry and unpack. Mrs. Page, it's your brother, Mr. Michael Cole. We're looking for. I expect you know that Gary Ash is wanted for questioning in connection with the murder in London. We're hoping your brother may have some idea of where he's hiding. At one time, when Ash was still in care, Mr. Cole took a particular interest in him. He did his very best for the boy. I know that. I also know how Ash repaid him. He virtually ruined my brother's career. But Michael never bore a grudge, you know. I think he liked Ash. Felt sorry for him. He still does. Where is your brother, Mrs. Page? He's not here. We both heard about Ash on the news last night. Michael didn't say anything. In fact, he went very quiet. 
When I came down this morning, he'd left on his bike. Mrs. Page, you know your brother. Please think very hard. Where would he be likely to go? Ash-liked, wide-open spaces in the sea. Looks to me as though Cole's gone off to some private spot known to the two of them to try a little redemption. God help him. Well done, Kate. We'll start a helicopter search as soon as possible. We'll take a 20-mile radius from the children's home in Ipswich. I'll see you at the hotel. Not a bad breakfast. What do you say? Best I've ever had. <laughs> Great thought, packing those tins of beans and sausage. Why don't you go down to the water and clean the plates and things? Okay. What'll you do? There's a spot I used to like when I came out here as a boy. I won't be long. Hey. Hello there. What? Who's that? Who are you? Get into the water with me. We'll swim across. I'll help you. Quick. Who are you? What are you talking about? Don't be afraid. You can do it. It's only about 30 feet. I'll help you. No. I've got a cycle up by the road. You can ride on the crossbar. No. We'll be in the nearest village before it's after us. You'll be cold and wet for a time, but anything's better than staying here. Oh, mad. Why should I come with you? Why? Get away from me. Keep, keep away. Listen. Janet Carpenter's dead. Murdered. Gary Ash did it. You must come away with me now. Please. He's dangerous. You're lying. It isn't true. The police sent you here to trick They us. don't know I'm here. How did you know where to find us? I brought him here. It was a long time ago. This was our special place. You're calling. Yes, but it doesn't matter who I am. You must get away. You can't stay with him. He needs help, but you can't give it. Neither of us can. No. No. Coley? Well, well, well. Long time no see. You heard what she said. She's staying here. And so are you. Gary, no. Put the knife down, boy. Here, give it to me. Come and get it, Coley. Come on. Come on, big boy. Take it off of me. Gary, I've killed him. It's his fault. He shouldn't have come. He should have left me alone. <laughs> Come and help me shift him. He's heavier than I thought. No, no, I can't. I won't. Then I must do it alone. <laughs> there. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? I want to get away. Let me go. I'll swim to shore. You'll do no such thing. <laughs> Come here. Oh, you're hurting me, Gary. I'll hurt you a lot more if you don't keep quiet. <laughs> Listen. Listen to that. Helicopter. Ten to one, it's the police. Now, stand still here with me. Ash! You're surrounded. There's no way out. Drop the light and come forward with your hands in the air. Throw down the knife, Ash. Enough is enough. This isn't going to help you. Don't be frightened, Octavia. It will be quick and it won't hurt. All right, Ash. What is it you want? Nothing that you can give! Ready? It won't hurt. Octavia! Octavia! It's all right. It's all right, Octavia. It's all over. It's all over. Thanks for coming to see me, Kate. I thought they might have stopped you. How are you feeling? Better. They're sending me out tomorrow. They seem to want me to see a counsellor. Can they make me? Of course not. 
But sometimes it helps. <laughs> Gary wouldn't have killed me, you know. We couldn't take that risk. I thought he loved me. It was as silly as thinking that Mummy loved me. Or Daddy. He's been to see me. But it wasn't any good. He doesn't want me. He loves that woman and Marie. No, I'm on my own. I'll have Mummy's money, but I can't live on that for the rest of my life. I think I'll try enrolling at some college. Take some A-levels. I think that's a very good idea. Hmm. What about Mummy? Now you know that Mrs. Carpenter just put on the wig and poured the blood. You'll find who murdered her, won't you? You're not going to give up? No, we won't give up. We never give up on murder. The next day, I went for the last time to Eight Paulet Court. It was late afternoon, and as I crossed the Temple Gardens, a thin wind crept up from the river behind me. As I reached the door of chambers, Simon Costello and Drysdale Lord were coming out together. Well met, Commander. I was just saying to Drysdale here, that was a bloody business down in the fence. Not pleasant, Mr Costello, no. I should have thought a posse of police could have arrested one man without blowing his head off. But I suppose we should be grateful. You've saved the country the expense of keeping him in prison for the next 20 years. And the cost of you or one of your colleagues having to defend him. Any news, Commander? We haven't come to make an arrest, I take it? Oh, no, of course not. There'll be at least two of you. No, Mr Lord, I haven't come to make an arrest. Good morning, gentlemen. Come in, Commander. Take a seat. Thank you. And to what do I owe the pleasure? Mr Ulrich, when we last spoke in this room, we talked of your brother's death. You said someone bore a heavy responsibility, but that it wasn't Venetia Aldridge. Did you by any chance mean yourself? That is... percipient, Commander. You were eleven years older. You were at Oxford, only a few miles away. Your parents were overseas. Did Marcus write to you about what was happening at school? Yes, he wrote. I should have gone to the school at once, but the letter came at the wrong time. I played cricket for my college. There was a match that day and a party in London afterwards. Then three more days passed. I intended to go to the school as soon as I could. On the fourth day, I received a call from my uncle with the news that Marcus had killed himself. And you destroyed Marcus's letter? I burned it, more in panic than anything else. There was, after all, more than enough evidence against the headmaster without it. I'm puzzled, Commander. Why exactly are you here? Because I think I know how and why Venetia Aldridge died. But you can't prove it, is that right? Commander... What I am about to tell you is a little for your satisfaction, but more, perhaps, for my own. Think of it as fiction. Picture a man, successful in his career, reasonably content, if not happy, but who loved only two people in his life. His baby brother, Marcus, and the daughter of his sister. Oh, he saw his niece, Despite her beauty, growing up selfish, greedy, even a little silly, it made no difference. But perhaps you would like to go on with the story. I think, though I've no evidence, that the niece phoned her uncle and told him that her husband's career was in jeopardy, that Venetia Aldrich was in a position to prevent him ever becoming a QC, might even destroy his career altogether. She pleaded with her uncle to use his influence to see it didn't happen. So I see him going upstairs to reason with Venetia Aldridge. It couldn't have been easy for him. I see him as a proud and private man. She was taking a phone call as he entered. He could tell it was a bad time. She'd had terrible news about her daughter, and her pleas for help from the men about her had been rejected. I think she responded to his pleas in kind. And there was something else she could throw in his face. I think it was Venetia Aldridge who posted Marcus's letter to his brother. Letters at prep school are invariably censored. How could it have got out, except with Venetia's help? A nice touch. Let's incorporate it into our piece of fiction. What next? Your turn. Well, let's suppose 
all the emotions suppressed for so many years come to the surface years of guilt disgust with himself anger that this woman whose family had already harmed him so much should be planning more destruction the paper knife was on the desk he grabbed it and struck he was amazed how easily the knife went in how little blood there was he placed the body in the chair turned off the light and closed the outer door he took the knife down to the basement washroom and cleaned it thoroughly and then he locked his briefcase in the bottom drawer of his desk and went upstairs slipping the knife into a filing cabinet on his way out he went straight to the restaurant for dinner where he'd booked his usual table to celebrate his birthday he was there by 8:15 does this seem to you a convincing hypothesis commander it's what i believe happened yes his indignation and disgust at seeing the body the next morning was unfeigned he did not place the wig on her head nor did he waste his own blood that was janet carpenter oh, i thought it might be so commander delglish we've devised a plausible solution to your problem of how a hard cold ruthless woman met her end what a pity for you that it's unprovable but don't reproach yourself commander i won't and i hope you don't imagine that i'm closing the case it'll remain open if nothing else it'll serve as a reminder that our system of law is human and therefore fallible and that the most we can hope to achieve is a certain justice mm -hmm.